Hey everybody, slap on your knowledge absorbers! We've got a holiday console showdown that you're not gonna wanna miss. So you'd probably have to be living under a rock to not know that there's a giant next-gen console showdown going on right now. There's a whole lot of talk about which one's better between the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X. Well, I can tell you, they're both pretty incredible, but which one's right for your family? And we'll also throw in a little sleeper pick there because that old guy that just won't die, the Nintendo Switch, is still around as well. So I'll talk about a few things today that might help you make a decision with your buying for the holidays for your family. I'll be going over a whole bunch of different things today. We'll be talking about what makes each console similar, what sets them apart, and ultimately just dropping a whole bunch of data points so you can make the right decision for your family during this holiday season. Now Black Friday is over, but you might not have made all the purchases that you want to make. If you're anything like me, you probably slept in a lot of Black Friday deals, didn't buy all the things you wanted to buy, and also just generally do a lot of shopping on Christmas Eve. Now as of the recording of this video, the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X are still pretty hard to come by. The Xbox is a little more available, it tends to be available a little bit more often and also for a longer period of time. The PlayStation really is almost impossible to get a hold of right now. But as the holidays ramp up, Sony and Microsoft are expected to ramp up a little bit more of their extra stock as they're trying to sell as many as they possibly can for the 2020 holiday season. Now of course, the Nintendo Switch and Switch Lite have been readily available for quite a long time because they've been out for a little while. Now I'll cover that a little bit later, but I want to start out today by talking about those next-gen consoles that everyone's trying to get their hot hands on right now. Now I'll start off by talking about what's pretty much the same about both consoles. The first thing is the price. Now both the Xbox and the PlayStation are listed at $499, and that's US dollars, not Euros, because the currency rates change all the time, I, I never have any idea how much each is once more this week, once more next week. Don't even talk about yen. Yen is crazy. I don't even know how to figure out yen. Those of you who are looking to not wait on a waiting list or possibly just hope to get a pre-order when maybe the direct orders open up, when they rarely do, you can actually buy through a reseller, in which case the availability really changes the price. PlayStations are up for about $2,000 at the time of this video, and Xboxes can be found for about $800 to $1,000. That's mostly just because the Xbox is a little more available than the PlayStation. So if you're looking to buy something and make sure you get your hands on it before it's Christmas Day, you may have to pay out a little bit more than you were planning to originally. Let's talk about performance. The Xbox Series X technically has slightly better specs than what the PlayStation 5 has. I won't go into them because they're so similar, the difference is actually very marginal. A lot of the games right now that are out though won't use the full potential of the processing power of either console for many years to come. So I think this is kind of a moot point, but you can also comment if you disagree. As far as storage capacity goes, the Xbox Series X actually has a full terabyte, which is about 20% larger than Sony's counterpart on the next gen console. But I'm not sure how much that matters. 20% is not a huge number, especially with the different ways that companies might compress their games, or data flows and save files might be in different sizes. So that's up for you to decide, kind of based on your experience, I guess. Where Sony seems to win is that the PlayStation actually has a faster transfer rate. It's actually about twice as fast. Sony's camp is boasting that this will not only help the game load faster initially, but it will also help when you fast travel or camp out or do anything that causes little interruptions in the game, those will go faster as well. So these are all really pretty much similarities, like one's a little faster here, one's a little more storage there, but they're really marginal as far as the differences. Now they both also have the same overall resolution, frame rate, and both come with the Blu-ray disc drive. So there's a lot of similarities there as well. Let's talk about the key differences now between these two next-gen juggernauts. Both of these consoles have games that are exclusive to those platforms. So you would have to have a PlayStation to play certain games and you have to have the Xbox to play other games. Now there's kind of a caveat with Microsoft that I'll talk about later, but since we're just talking about the consoles, we'll start here. PlayStation already has launched with Spider-Man Miles Morales, which is a really cool game from all the things I'm hearing. The PS5 also has a lot of games that have been Sony exclusives for a long time and are kind of more franchise titles. God of War may have a few releases in this series, Gran Turismo may also see a few releases, and Final Fantasy 16 has already been announced. There's also a cool game called Demon's Souls, which I've heard a few good things about. And also my personal favorite that I'm looking forward to the most is Horizon Forbidden West, which is the sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn, which was kind of an independent title on the PlayStation 4, and it really surprised a few people with how excellent it was. 
Now, Microsoft also has a lot of franchises that are proprietary to their platform as well. We can expect more Gears of War games, more Halo games. In fact, Halo Infinite is the next game in the Halo series. Also, Forza Motorsports should come out with a few games as well. Also, later, a Fable reboot has been announced, so I'm kind of looking forward to that one. I liked the Fable series for a long time, especially the first few games, so seeing a reboot? Hey, I'll welcome it. Now, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, which was the first game in the series, really kind of took a deep dive into mental illness, and it was it was a pretty terrifying game, I'm not gonna lie. So, it's not for a lot of people, but the sequel should be really awesome. So here's my bold take on these exclusive games, guys. I think Sony tends to be a little bit more innovative when it comes out with their exclusive titles. You know, Xbox just kind of relies on a lot more of the franchises that they know and they trust, and Sony kind of, like, stretches outside the box a little bit. If you disagree with me, make sure you let me know in the comments section below. Now, one of the things that really sets Xbox apart from PlayStation is the backwards compatibility. Microsoft will allow you to play any Xbox game back to the original OG Xbox on the new Series X. Whereas Sony is only allowing you to play PS4 games and it looks like not even all of them. So if that's a difference maker for you, that's kind of a big deal. I kind of look at it as the argument between Apple and Android. There's a lot of people in both camps, but most people just keep buying the smartphone they're more familiar with. Now, when it comes to gaming and these next-gen platforms, both Sony and Microsoft will at least let you play the previous gen's titles, at least most of them, so a lot of times people might just want to buy the one they're used to. Another key difference maker is that Sony has actually allowed a digital-only edition, which means you can't actually buy discs for it. You have to download the games through Sony's PlayStation Store, but it's kind of nice because it is $100 cheaper. It's $399 versus the $499, and if you're someone that doesn't necessarily want to buy discs or use the Blu-ray player functionality, this is a great fit for you because you'll save a lot of money. Sliding back to a point in Microsoft's camp, Microsoft invented a whole new thing for their consoles called Microsoft Quick Resume. I actually read it as Quick Resume the first time and was really confused. Now what Quick Resume does is it allows players to play one game, stop that game, go to another game, and then go back to that previous game when they're done playing the second game very seamlessly. The transfer takes seconds, they say. Now, current consoles don't allow for this, so this is kind of a cool innovation because it removes a lot of the back and forth when you say, hey, I'm tired of playing this game, I wanna play a different game, but then you've gotta go through all the loading screens and the loading titles and all that stuff that just takes forever that the first time you see it is all fun and cool, but after the 500th time you're kind of over it, this gets rid of that. And if I do buy the Xbox, I will use this feature a lot. As far as the controller goes, man, PlayStation has a clear advantage here. The controller's been redesigned, but overall it still kind of fits and feels the same way, but the coolest thing they've done is allowed for an adaptive feedback. Now what this means to you is that different developers and different games can have different trigger sensitivities, allowing different games to essentially have whole different settings. So if you're playing a game where the trigger sensitivity doesn't matter, maybe that's a looser trigger, or something where you need a lot of control, they can do that, which is really, really cool, and this sets the controller apart, because innovation is cool. Now, Microsoft has chosen not to innovate this time, and you can use previous Xbox controllers with the new console on certain games. This is kind of also an advantage because it saves you a little bit of money, because you can use controllers that you already have in your house. But it doesn't really speak to innovation, so, eh, point Sony? As if we're tracking points anyways. So now the juggernaut next-gen consoles are out of the way with the things I want to talk about today. But I wanted to make sure we don't sleep on the Switch, because the Nintendo Switch may be the right fit for your family. Now, Nintendo actually has two versions of the Switch. Now, the original Nintendo Switch is $299. That's the one that's designed to be played either as a console that plugs into your TV and gives you the full experience, or as a handheld gaming device. Now, the second version of the Switch is actually the Switch Lite. This one is only a handheld version. You can't actually take off the controllers like you can on the original version, but you actually can be more portable and it's a little bit cheaper. The Nintendo Switch Lite comes in at $199 and it actually comes in multiple colors as well. So there's a lot of flexibility there also. It just removes the ability to actually go and hook up to your TV. Some of you might be wondering why would I buy a Nintendo Switch if it's been out for a long time and the next gen consoles are kicking its butt. Honestly, the Switch has never really relied on graphics power to be its primary income driver. What it relies on is having a lot of low cost games and low cost titles and a whole bunch of titles and generally just makes a lot more fun games that the family can play together. It's a lot more kid friendly. Now kids don't always rely on graphics. In fact, most of the time they really don't care about them. I mean, some of the most popular kid games right now are Roblox and Minecraft. And if you've seen those games, 
They're not that graphic intense. They're actually probably able to run on most cell phones, to be honest with you. Kids want to play what's the most fun for them. And graphics are kind of important sometimes. It's nice to see something that looks cool, but graphics won't keep their attention as long as it would for an adult. Now, this is not to say the graphics on the Switch are bad. They're just not as good as the next-gen Super Consoles. So if you're looking to buy something for a younger family, the Switch is probably honestly a really good way to go. And it'll save you a lot of money. The Switch is not just for kids, though. It's also great for people on the go. It's really nice for periods of time when you really just want to kind of pass the time a little bit faster. And that's why I bought one. I actually used to fly a lot at work. And so I got a Switch because on the airplane, watching movies, I could count down the time it took for a two-hour movie, but playing a game, I got lost in that world. Before I knew it, my flight from Dallas to Phoenix, taking about two and a half hours, was wheels up and then landing before I even really knew a lot of time had passed. Also, as far as games go, of course, Nintendo owns Mario and they also own Zelda. So both those titles have a lot of cool games and probably will have a lot of cool games coming out. Let's talk about Zelda Breath of the Wild, for instance. One of the coolest RPGs ever doesn't rely on graphics. I would have thought that, you know, a lot of RPGs really rely on a lot of story, but the graphics are almost an essential piece. You almost have to have that. Well, Zelda Breath of the Wild taught us otherwise. That game is incredible. It's widely heralded as perhaps the best RPG and it's really not graphic intense and it's played on the Switch. So, hey, you know what? Something for everyone, I guess, right? So summing it all up, I can't tell you which console to buy. That's up to you and really what's right for your family. I can tell you what I have. Now, remember that caveat earlier I said about Xbox games? Most Xbox games, if not soon all Xbox games, can be played also on a PC through the Microsoft Store. So, if you get a PlayStation, you can't play them on PC, but if you get an Xbox, you can play those games on PC. My suggestion really is for people that have a PC, get the PlayStation, because then you get the best of both worlds. You get the Microsoft titles, but you also get the PlayStation games on that console. Now, I also have a Switch because, again, I do have young kids and I do travel a lot. I've got a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old, and honestly, the Switch is just easier for them to play with because the little handheld controllers actually are smaller and they fit in their hands better. So that may be something to even think about is just controller size. But it's all up to you guys. Hey, in the comments section, let me know either what you already own if you've made a decision on these three consoles, or let me know what you think you may end up buying, because I'd really love to know. So guys, don't forget, if you like this video, hit the like button for us. It really helps us out. If you didn't like the video, well, hit the like button anyways. It'll help us out and just, I don't know, never come back. Just tell a friend you didn't like it, and maybe they'll come watch and see if they don't like it. Don't forget, guys, to follow the channel by hitting the subscribe button, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so you can watch more videos by American Gaming Dad. Thanks a lot, happy holidays, and I hope to see you soon.